Um, thank you, Tim. I, uh, it's a little bit, for Americans, that's a little bit of an embarrassing fact going to space camp when you're young. It's uh, slightly nerdy, so I am guilty as charged. Um, so uh, thanks for having me. Um, and on behalf of Twilio, um, you know, really excited to kind of speak about, um, you know, not, not just Twilio, but, uh, you know, APIs in general and, and um, you know, uh, developer communities. Um, so, so the subject for today um, was about the idea of a de facto API platform. And what I thought I'd, what I thought I'd do is, um, you know, try not to bludgeon everyone to death with PowerPoint, but um, just talk a little bit about uh, Twilio, what we do, just, just for some context. Um, and then talk a little bit about um, at least uh, how we's, we've observed um, developer community and, um, you know, the importance of, uh, of catering to that developer community with, um, you know, with a platform that works for them. Um, so feel free to, uh, you know, chime in with a question if you have any as, as, we, uh, as we go through it. Um, and, uh, and we'll also have some time at the end for questions as well. Um, so, so to start out, Twilio, what Twilio is, is uh, we're a platform. Um, we're a set of APIs for developers to build applications that communicate. It's really a, a tool set uh, for those developers to make voice and messaging intelligent. Um, the, the idea of taking a set of instructions or, or intelligence in, that are, that are uh, created by those instructions and, make, and apply those to the, to the flow of a call or a voice message. Um, we're based in the cloud, Amazon Web Services, um, so uh, following that global footprint around the world, um, and then connect globally with uh, several carrier partners um, around the globe as well um, to, to match that footprint. And so what do we mean by controlling the flow of a call or a message? Um, really, that could be from a traditional phone. It could be from a mobile application using iOS or Android. It could be from a web browser by a RT, WebRTC. Um, it's really the idea of basically incorporating intelligence into the flow of any of these you know, communication uh, interactions. The platform has been pretty successful already. Uh, we have, whoops, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, <laughs> I've got two presentations going here. Um, the platform is uh, pretty successful already. Um, we've got uh, 250,000 developers worldwide. And, and what that means is 250,000 businesses, whether they be two guys in a garage building the next startup or major enterprises like uh, you know, Intuit and Home Depot and Box, um, there are 250,000 businesses who have built some application or service using Twilio. And so why is this relevant? Why, you know, why does this matter? Well, the chances are most of the people in this room have probably used Twilio in some way, shape, or form, and, and maybe you didn't even know it. So has anyone in the room used Square to, uh, to, to make a payment sometime before? Show of hands. So if you've used Square, you've, you've used Twilio. Um, if you've received a text message receipt from Square, to verify and, and, and record your, your transaction. You know, you went to a farmer's market and made a payment, or you went to a small restaurant, or, or just a small merchant that was using Square, maybe a coffee stand, uh, and they sent you a text, you received a text message afterward, that text message was sent using Twilio. Uh, Square integrated their uh, payment service to incorporate messaging um, as, a, as part of that customer experience. Um, so is anyone familiar with Uber? Anyone? use Uber before. Imagine some people in the room probably took Uber to get here today. <laughs> um, so Uber, uh, you know, relatively new service. It's been around for a few years now. Um, it, it allows a, a passenger, someone that's looking for a ride, uh, to basically request a ride, request a pickup, and then a network of drivers drive around the city and, you know, starting out being town cars, now it's taxis and private cars. Um, to accept that ride and actually deliver you as a passenger to, uh, to where you need to go. So if you're standing outside your hotel, request a ride using, uh, uh, using your, your, your phone, the application on your phone to, um, to uh, uh, alert the driver that you're ready. A uh, driver can accept that ride and take you on your way to the airport or restaurant or wherever. So if you received a text message uh, or a call as a passenger using Uber, um, or maybe even a text message with a receipt after you completed your ride, then you've used Twilio before. Uber had, has built the voice and messaging piece into their, into their application using Twilio. 
Um, anyone go to Home Depot and uh, maybe have an experience like I have where you show up to Home Depot, you have, it's Saturday, you've got uh, big plans for a home project, fill up your cart with a bunch of stuff for who knows what project, make your way to the front of the store and realize as you look at your cart, I am not qualified whatsoever to do this job that I've just bought, a, that I'm about to buy a bunch of stuff for. So um, the good news is if you've had that experience like I have, you're not alone because uh, Home Depot has so many customers that have that exact same experience that they decided to create a new service to help those people get in touch with professional contractors. So imagine you're up at the front of uh, Home Depot, you, you realize in a panic you need help to build the deck at your house that you've uh, you know, showed up to buy a bunch of lumber for. Uh, well, Home Depot has a service called Red Beacon. Um, and what you do is you go in, at, it's at the end of each aisle in the front of all of their stores across the country, and you enter your phone number and a one-line description of the job that you have to do, build a deck at your house. And then what Home Depot will do is connect you to its network of professional contractors and basically programmatically um, go through the people that are in your area that are qualified to build a deck, maybe they're a carpenter, and are available to do the job you know, on the date that you need. And then they'll match you and connect you right there in the store via voice or text with that professional contractor. So that whole piece that, that, that Home Depot built, the Red Beacon service, is built using Twilio. Introducing communication as, a, as part of that retail experience in the store. And finally, if, any, if anyone's used uh, storage, you know, cloud-based service, Box is an example, you know, thousands of cloud-based services where uh, you might have to authenticate yourself. You know, you show up to Las Vegas, you're on a different network with a different IP address and maybe even using a different device. Box wants to verify who you are, make sure you, you are the user that you say you are. So you might receive a text message um, or, or a voice call and prom prompting you to enter a PIN to verify your identity. So that whole piece, that's the two-factor authentication using voice and messaging, is, is built by Box using Twilio. And so, so what's the common thread here? What do we see as a common thread in all of these you know, customer user experiences? It's that communication is core to each of these user experiences. Whether it's you know, the Uber transportation, uh, your, the, the problem they're solving is, is picking up and, and getting a ride from point A to point B, but communication is a core piece of that. On the payment solution, actually recording and, and delivering to you as a user um, what happened in that transaction you just made, that's, that's communication as part of that user experience. And so why do we see, why does this matter? Um, why are companies like Twilio so, um, and, and we're certainly not the only one, why are we so bullish on the opportunity? Why now? Um, well, if you've read or heard anything from, uh, from this guy before, um, you've probably heard that uh, software may in fact be eating the world. Um, well, we're pretty big believers in that and I, I, I can assume that most of the people in the room here are, are big believers as well. And, and we see this happening all around us. And really there are, there are um, a couple of macro level trends that really kind of contribute to this opportunity, that create this opportunity. The first is what we'll call the migration from the closet to the cloud. Um, you know, the old way of building was to buy some hardware, um, you know, hire an army of consultants to come and, you know, service that, har service that hardware and probably pay a ton of money, um, you know, meet some minimum threshold of volume or capacity in order even to, or to, to even warrant, you know, uh, uh, becoming a customer of, of that vendor. Um, and all of that just to, just to deliver, you know, your specific solution. Well, well, now the new way of building is obviously to put infrastructure in the cloud, you know, pay, f pay only for what you need and then adjust in a timely, you know, efficient, efficient way. Um, and so we see this more and more. I mean, the, these customers like, in relatively new companies, the, the Airbnbs, the Ubers, the, the uh, boxes of the world, they're inclined to use the cloud wherever possible. Their first option is not necessarily to buy hardware and put it up in their, in their office in, in, a, in a storage closet. Um, the second macro trend is, is the shift from, you know, single or, or special purpose devices to general purpose computers. So, um, when I say general purpose computers, I'm talking about connected laptops, I'm talking about smartphones, you know, uh, tablets. Um, we're basically all carrying around now uh, completely, um, you know, flexible generalized computing devices versus, you know, walking around and uh, walking into a, a conference room with a, 
uh, you know, a polycom uh, a single, single telephone or a desk phone, um, you know, things that really only did one thing. And so the result is you now have these two trends allowing an abstraction of the hardware problems that are on either side. So in the cloud, you have all this, you know, hardware infrastructure with a, that's abstracted by a software layer on top of it. And on the, on the device side, you have these, you know, instead of having single purpose devices that actually have to connect in, in a very specific way, you have these flexible devices with a software layer on top of it, you know, an operating system like Android or iOS. And so it allows the, the businesses that are trying to solve problems for customers to do so using software. And so that's really where we see the opportunity going. You have these, these problems that were formerly hardware-based problems like, you know, a phone or a payment solution. Um, you know, this device has a lot of buttons on it and it still only does one thing. Um, now you see payments as being a software-based solution. Um, even something as mundane as, uh, you know, hailing a cab or trying to wave, you know, even, even if anyone's had the painful experience of calling dispatch to try to get a, ta a taxi or a car. Um, now this is a software-based solution. Um, and so, you know, really we see uh, it, it, all of these things factoring into creating a, a pretty big opportunity for not just Twilio, but companies that are taking that, you know, software-based approach. Um, a little background on our company, I mentioned the 250,000 developer customers. Um, we're very specific, specifically focused on communication. So the idea of, uh, you know, voice and messaging, um, you know, IP communication, uh, all of these kind of uh, really, really being a narrow, very specific focus for us. Um, on, the, uh, on the voice and, and messaging side, we have origination in 50 plus countries today. That means you can buy a phone number from Twilio that is, uh, you know, a, a Singapore phone number, an Australia phone number, a, a Hong Kong phone number, a, a, a UK phone number. Um, and we can terminate to 150 countries um, and, and 1,800 operators today. And I'll mention, you know, why this may matter in, in a minute. Um, in terms of revenue, we've seen, you know, we're a relatively young company, but seen pretty good growth in, uh, uh, in the few years that we've been around. Um, we'll do about 50 million in revenue this year. And um, last year we did about 22, 23, year before that about 11. So what we're seeing as a result is, is we're at this point where we've shifted from becoming just solely about independent developers to really seeing you know, major businesses and enterprise starting to build and that's resulting in, in some significant revenue growth. And so it gets to our discussion today of, about you know, why the adoption? Um, what goes into building a community and uh, building a platform and, and, and there, therefore a, a very healthy developer community. Um, you know, what are the steps to becoming, you know, what someone might call a de facto uh, standard platform? Um, in short, why, why the widespread adoption? And so we believe that the success, this success that we've, we've seen um, is really the result of doing about, uh, doing three things particularly well. Um, the first is the focus on developer experience. And so, um, you know, what, what does that mean? I think a lot of people talk about developer experience. Well, many times the approach to building APIs, and, and this is not isolated to the world of telecommunication, it applies to other, you know, other, other industries as well. Um, but many times the focus is to fo the, the, the approach is to focus first on the assets. You know, what do we have? What are the network assets that we have? What can we expose? And, uh, and then create you know, a method to expose those and therefore after that a developer experience. Um, you know, trying to do things within a framework that already exists. If you're, a, if you're an operator, you know, trying to take the network assets that you have in, in countries or in platforms on those networks in those countries uh, and kind of think about things within your own kind of framework. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, that approach results in a pretty confined, you know, developer experience. And so, um, you know, instead, the approach really should be focused on the developer needs first. You know, instead of trying to expose the things that you know you have, you instead focus on, it's, it's a subtle distinction, you instead focus on what the developers are, are trying to do, what problems are they trying to solve. And then, once you truly understand those, those problems that they're trying to solve, then you focus on how to actually deliver the tools that they need. And so, um, the development really should be attuned to the customer needs. Um, you know, the idea of getting feedback and then developing based on this. Um, to give you an example, um, 
Twilio, the, the way that Twilio works, we're, what we did was develop this proprietary markup language, a, a language called um, Twimmel, Twilio markup language. Um, uh, quite cryptic. Um, so, uh, you know, the way that we think about it is, um, you know, it started out doing very basic things like say and play and dial, things related to, you know, voice calls and messages. Um, but as we, as we saw what our customers were doing, it, doing with it, what, what they were actually building, we would see, you know, common use cases um, kind of develop. And so we saw a lot of people starting to uh, create call lists, a queue of calls to dial through. And so um, they were each having to do, you know, hundreds of lines of code in order to basically build the same thing. And so what we did was try to help solve that problem. And instead of forcing every customer to build that, you know, 100 line plus of code in order to create a call queue, we instead went into development and created a new queue that basically sums it up in a single command called queue. So we launched that, uh, you know, last year. But really that's an example of really paying close attention to what your developer community is doing and then making adjustments based on their feedback and also just observing at a basic level what they're doing and give them more tools, more primitive commands. You know, not going all the way up to application development, but really just more tools that they can do, that they can use to, to and, and you're making their lives easier in the, in the interim. It's, you're reducing the amount of code that they have to write, allowing them to focus on bigger problems rather than having to, you know, contort themselves to work with the, with the framework of your platform. So the second thing is to offer global connectivity. Um, and I think, in, you know, particularly in the, in the um, mobile operator space, uh, this is a big topic. Um, we were just talking about this a bit at the break, and, and one of the challenges, if you're a, a, even the biggest mobile operator in the world, is, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to piece together what, could, what would be described as true global connectivity. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's maybe not necessarily in the, in the best interest of, of one of the big mobile operators, uh, you know, Vodafone, to go, to a, go you know, line up a partnership with every mobile operator they're competing with. Maybe that's not best necessarily the best approach. The, you know, by focusing on the developer experience, which I mentioned before, um, you realize that global connectivity is actually really important. Um, it follows that developers don't want to have to repeat things. They, they, they want to build the application once. They want to learn the platform platform one time. And so the challenge for these largest operators is, is um, actually deliver on that. You know, for a developer uh, to piece together a truly global product, um, they would have to actually piece together multiple APIs from multiple operators to make it happen. To basically to accomplish the exact same thing. So imagine, you know, a FedEx is, a, is trying to solve a global problem. Well, they would have to go to Vodafone and work on, with Vodafone in those countries. Maybe they have to go to Airtel or Singtel in other countries. And, and they're basically having to conform their application uh, based on the connectivity that they desire. And so the result is a pretty bad ex you know, uh, developer experience because you're now, your application now is conforming to all those different standards that people have, have set up for you. And so the third thing is, um, another one I think is particularly important, I mean, uh, particularly for the, for the mobile operator space is, is to project yourself as a company, to be open for business. And, and what do I mean by open for business? Um, well, developers are not going to build an application, a, a vital mission critical service on something that's perceived to be a science experiment. You know, something that's in beta or it's a sandbox or it's put out there for experimentation. Um, it sounds terrific and, you know, it, you're demonstrating that things are technically feasible with, you know, call control or uh, location or whatever, but it's, unfortunately, it's the, the developer programs and API efforts around the world, a, a lot of them with operators, have been kind of launched by the R&D or innovation group, which is great to kind of understand the technology, but it doesn't do a whole lot for the developer um, that's, that's probably a business or enterprise trying to build a customer-facing service. The truth is they're not going to build on something that's perceived to be a, a, a science experiment. And so, um, you know, Twilio has really been, we, we've always projected ourselves as being, you know, clearly open for business. It's not an experiment. We are, we're charging for the service, um, putting the full weight of the company behind uh, the platform, signing people up for, you know, our customers up for SLAs, delivering on those SLAs, giving them enterprise type of service. Because that's what they need. They need to have that confidence that the thing that they're building on, the platform, is there for the long haul. And so unfortunately, as you know, technically, technical feasibility doesn't 
always uh, you know, result in adoption. It's really important to actually project yourself as being kind of truly, truly open for business. And so, you know, the thing that we kind of remind ourselves, um, at least at our company, uh, you know, again and again, is it, it's, it's the approach to the product that's most important. Um, you know, Twilio did not invent the voice API or the messaging API. Those, that, that technical feasibility long predates Twilio. Um, you know, really what we did was focus on a new developer-centric approach to building out a platform. And, you know, our aim as a company is to win the hearts and minds of developers. And, and we think that if we can actually succeed in doing that, to really, really appeal to that uh, community of developers, that, you know, um, the, the kind of result would be that you're perceived to be a, you know, you get the adoption um, and potentially, you know, earn the right to be perceived as a de facto standard. And so the approach is really kind of the most important thing to us. And, and when people ask us about developer community, that's, that's what we talk about. So that's it. That's, uh, that's all I had. Um, yeah. <laughs>